Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech24. I'm Julia Seeger. Bitcoins, NFTs, cryptocurrencies, many technologies shaping the future are encrypted in the blockchain. This, however, requires significant computing power and hence consumes a lot of energy. So how can we reduce its carbon footprint? The answer in a moment. And in Test24, Peter O'Brien has brought a model of a nanosatellite launcher. The real version is set to be 10 times bigger and should be up and running by 2024. NFT art, also known as crypto art, combines a digital work of art with a unique tamper-proof certificate encrypted in the blockchain. This is a revolution in itself because it makes it possible for the first time in the digital world to distinguish an original version from its copies and to give it an ownership title. The owner then receives an NFT or non-fungible token which certifies that he is indeed the official owner of the art of work. Mike Winkleman, for instance, alias Beeple, sold this piece for nearly $70 million in cryptocurrency. The problem is that the underlying technology, the blockchain, has a high carbon footprint. Well, to talk more about it, our guest John Karp has just joined us. Hello, John. Uh, you're the co-author of NFT Revolution, the co-host of the NFT Morning podcast on Clubhouse. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Julia. So I've just touched on the concept of NFTs, and it seems like many people are struggling to understand the hype here. Most people get the point of buying an original masterpiece, for instance, but fail to understand the point when it comes to digital artwork. So are NFTs triggering a revolution, and is it, in the end, a whole new way of thinking? Yeah, I totally agree with you on the fact that it's a revolution. You know, thinking that it's a short-term hype uh, it's a mistake for me. And I believe, you know, that NFTs will change the world for the next decade or the next century. Let's visualize that we became digital people. We spend more time interacting with people via social media or via email than in real life. We are buying online. And so for me, it totally makes sense that our visible sign of wealth become also digital asset. This is why, you know, so far millennials already spend uh, I think it's $2 billion of dollars that has been spent last year in Fortnite to buy wearables like a uh, shirt or jacket just to show your friends, you know, that it's you and, uh, you know, be different than the other one. And so for me, it totally makes sense, you know, that you want to get this in your social media or tomorrow when you do a Skype or something like this, you want to show instead of a Hawaiian beach, uh, show something like uh, the, the, the artwork that you own, for example. So, and to come back to people like Beeple, you know, when you sell something like this, you need to understand that Beeple is recognized as a main artist and has been recognized for the last 15 years. You know, he's been doing a great performance. So far, he was not able to live thanks to his artwork, you know. He was working for agencies, but he didn't sell his work. Thanks to NFT, for the first time in history, he's able to sell his artwork. And it's the same, you know, for people or other artists like Pac or Ferocious. They are the master, for me, of the 21st century, like Rembrandt or Renoir or Picasso has been, you know, uh, in the previous uh, in the previous centuries. So, you know, in 40, 50 years from now, people will say, yeah, you know, in 2020 or 2021, these people made history. Now, for a long time, the artistic world in general has been quite reluctant to use NFTs because uh, of their carbon footprint. But recently, the artist JR took the plunge with a more, more green method. What is it all about? Yeah, so basically to make it simple, uh, they, you know, it's a rely, the NFTs rely on the blockchain. And blockchain uh, is a protocol that consumes a lot of energy because for the Ethereum blockchain, that is a historical one, you need uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of computers just to validate one transaction. With new blockchains that has appeared you know, in the last three or four years, you only want one computer instead of thousands you know, to do the same work. It's a new protocol called the proof of stack. And basically, you know, GR has been using this new blockchain called Palm that, you know, uh, consume much less energy and that is defined as a 
carbon neutral blockchain. And there are many other blockchains like this. You know, one of the most famous one called as a clean NFT blockchain is the Tezos one. Uh, and you have many platforms, you know, that use now this uh, new blockchain and that became carbon neutral thanks to that. John Karp, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us here on Tech24. Thank you. And for more on this, let's bring in our tech editor, Peter O'Brien. Hello, Peter. Hello, Julia. Now, whether you're buying or not NFTs, it's still going to be energy intensive, uh, no matter what uh, you do, if you're just using cryptocurrencies, pretty much so, uh, especially Bitcoin. Is there any way that we can better conserve the energy? Well, that's precisely what the city of North Vancouver wants to do. It's planning to be the world's first city heated by Bitcoin. Okay, that claim may be a bit exaggerated, but it's struck a deal with Mint Green, which is a clean tech crypto mining company, and they're going to use recovered heat from their Bitcoin mines to help warm up 100 buildings collected connected to the district energy grid. Over in Quebec, many businesses are actually opening crypto farms, not just as a way to make a bit of money on the side, but actually heat their premises as well. Notably, there's one strawberry farm whose greenhouses are heated by crypto. Now, what about finding a more sustainable source of energy in the first place? Well, it all depends on location, not Every country has 20 volcanoes in 20,000 square kilometers like El Salvador does. El Salvador has just um, launched its first Bitcoin mines, which are powered by geothermal plants. So that's literally the heat from their volcanoes going directly into powering their Bitcoin mining. Isn't the best solution to go back to the root problem and create a whole new type of blockchain? Yeah, it's, it's exactly what John Karp was saying. Um, there are, of course, other blockchains which are more sustainable, like Tezos he mentioned. But for me, the most important one by far is going to be Ethereum 2.0. It's set to complete rolling out next year, by which point it will be almost entirely um, based on this new sustainable model, which doesn't require massive banks of computers churning out maths equations to try and create new coins. It will prevent a huge amount of environmental damage. It's expected to actually cut Ethereum's emissions by 99%, which is a really good thing because at the moment, just one NFT um, on, on average uh, emits about the, about the same amount of um, carbon emissions as driving 1,000 kilometers in a car. Thank you very much, Peter, for that. Moving on now to a whole other story. The U.S.'s top military commander has confirmed a test by China of hypersonic weaponry. After a missile fired this summer reportedly circled the entire world before falling 30 kilometers short of its target. It's the first time the U.S. has acknowledged the Chinese test, even as President Biden has expressed general concerns about the development of hypersonic weapons. It's a next-generation missile which can go faster than 6,000 kilometers per hour. That's five times the speed of sound. This particular model was shown off two years ago at the 70-year anniversary celebrations of the People's Republic of China in Beijing. A new, highly advanced version was reportedly tested this summer. The revelation, published by the Financial Times on the 16th of October, has provoked concern in Washington. Our own pursuit of uh, hypersonic capabilities uh, is, is real, um, it's tangible, and, and, and we are absolutely working uh, towards being able to develop that capability. The hypersonic missiles can be equipped with nuclear warheads. They're able to reach orbit before hitting their target, thus evading modern radar systems. China has denied that it carried out the missile tests, arguing that it was a routine spacecraft and that the U.S. is deflecting blame. The U.S. is the first country to conduct the research and development of hypersonic weapons. We've noted that the U.S. expressed concerns over China's normal spacecraft test and plays up the China threat theory. Defense analysts are concerned that the incident could further escalate the global arms race. Russia and North Korea both claim to have successfully fired hypersonic weaponry this year, while the United States' most recent test failed to launch on October the 21st. And we're going to keep on talking about space in Test 24.
Europe is looking to contend in the new space race and fend off challenges from other superpowers and multi-billion dollar private companies. Well, to talk about one plucky startup that's taken up the challenge, Peter O'Brien has just brought us this quite large object. Yes, it's rather big, isn't it? It's Zephyr made by Venture Orbital Systems, and it's the first rocket designed and manufactured in France since 1975. It's not the real thing, of course. The real thing is 12 times as big. It's at 15 meters, which we couldn't quite fit in the studio. But even 15 meters long, that's still quite a small rocket. In fact, it's a micro launcher. It's designed specifically to launch small satellites into orbit. So here's the first stage here. It's this lower bit, then they've got the second stage, and right at the top is the payload. In the payload, you can put up to 70 kilograms of satellites, so that's about three to six microsatellites. Um, Venture Orbital Systems says they'll be launching their first microsatellites into space within three years. Now, as well as the SpaceX's and Virgin orbits of the world, there are plenty of European uh, companies at this game as well. For instance, in Germany, you've got companies like OHB, you've got ESAR Aerospace in Spain, there's PLD Space and Orbex in the United Kingdom. So make no mistake, this is a field which is really driven by competition more than by collaboration. Now, Peter, let's just rewind for just a second. Why are these nanosatellites sent into space in the first place? Well, they're incredibly versatile. You can design them to do all manner of things. It's not just tele telecoms, the Internet of Things. It's also all manner of Earth observation, so observing climate, climate change, agriculture, natural disasters, the list goes on. Their true power, though, comes when they're deployed as part of a constellation. As you can sort of see here, this is the launch of an Indian constellation of microsatellites. Um, they're getting cheaper and cheaper, of course, um, but they still cost millions of euros to launch. That, though, could be changing thanks to things like this. Now, this is the rocket engine developed by Venture Orbital Systems, and it's called Navier. It's 3D printed in just three parts within a week. And with a traditional uh, boost rocket booster, of course, it takes months to assemble and it takes hundreds of parts. Now, why, while the Zephyr uses liquid oxygen and rocket propellant, well, this gives better propulsion, of course, um, but costs more than solid fuel. Startups like Hyperspace in Bordeaux, which belongs to the same startup accelerator, is looking into a mixture of hybrid and liquid fuel for cheaper thrusters. If they're successful, who knows, you could be launching your own micro or nano satellite from your back garden. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Well, we're coming to the end of the show, but this is also the very last edition of Tech24 in this weekly format as you know it. But the whole Tech24 team remains mobilized, and Peter O'Brien and I will continue bringing you the very latest tech and science news, but this time on a daily basis. Peter, thank you very much for all of these uh, fascinating segments, but also these very original tests. Thank you for your good vibes and pleasure. also uh, your expertise and uh, your clarity. It was a pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Julia. And I'd also like to thank, of course, all of our producers and the technical team that have made these shows possible in the last 10 years. Thank you as well, of course, uh, viewers, for tuning in. Stay safe and see you soon.